Hey YouTubers, it's Martin here. Just want to say a quick thank you specifically to you for listening to the podcast on YouTube. I still can't believe it's a thing, but apparently it is. This whole kind of sub-community of people that listen to podcasts on a platform that's all about video, but thank you very much, however you choose to listen to the podcast. But here on YouTube, thank you so much uh, for listening on here. I love the comments that you do on YouTube, and I love absolutely the interaction and the community that is built up in the uh, the comments section of all the, the podcasts. Of course, this podcast is available on all the usual places you get podcasts from. So iTunes, TuneIn, Google Play, and if you want to check them out on there or subscribe, if you use podcast apps as well, a reminder that you might not know if you listen to this on YouTube only that it is actually started as a podcast before it came on here. Welcome to a Saturday special. Every Saturday I like to do these kind of things and talk to the biggest names we can find in the EV community. Big doesn't necessarily mean as in their CEOs and VPs. I just mean that they're doing some things that are really interesting. But as it happens today, we are talking to a founder of a charging company who used to work for somebody else, a previous charge point manufacturer, decided that he saw the things that he liked, saw the things that he didn't like, and was going to start his own company. Back in 2014, Charlie Jardine decided that enough was enough, quit his job, and started a family business. And when I say family business, it's still run, or it's uh, it's still based parts of it in their, their factory is on the farm, the family farm. So this is a proper family business that's growing very quickly. I'm super delighted to get him on the podcast today because I think what you're going to hear is someone who not only is an entrepreneur but a real heavy thinker as well in terms of where EVs are at the moment and where they're going and the kind of business that he wants to build and how it will affect you in terms of the kind of charges that you buy but also how your EV, your car, works in your life. His name is Charlie Jardine. Uh, This was recorded a few days ago when he popped in to have a chat to me and it was a great, a great opportunity to welcome him to the podcast. Enjoy this one. Welcome. Kick us off. Give us Charlie's origin story. So how did you end up founding a company then? Went to university, did design and technology management at Leeds. I started a couple of businesses there. Uh, so I've always had business in, in the, my blood. My parents um, both had businesses, so I was kind of always destined. Um, I, I went to go and work for a company called Podpoint, and Podpoint manufacture charging stations. They're one of the first manufacturers of EV charging points in the UK, and I joined them pretty much the summer after the the time I left uni. Loved it. Went from pretty sceptical about EVs to being completely sold. I'd always been a bit of a car person, you know, reading uh, magazine car magazines in my dormitory at school. You know, having had kind of 18 months there, I'd got to the point where I was getting itchy feet. I got to the stage where I was uh, getting slightly uh, fed up. January 2015... I decided to uh, leave Podpoint. The dismay of my father, who told me I was an an idiot, uh, and why would you ever leave a stable job, despite him having uh, only worked for himself. In the the EV market, I'd seen things that I liked and didn't like, and we decided on building charging stations for homes, fleets, and destinations. Of course, having a bit of experience in the sector helped, and when we started with a, a... clean sheet of paper we could take our experience from other parts of the industry so it wasn't just me I am the founder but my dad is uh, now our managing director and we'd worked in the early days with a guy from the old company some local engineers software developers and installers and and again you know took their their feedback and and built the product um, with a view to to really just building something that was really simple you know the founding principle of the business is that charging has to be really simple it's scary enough buying an electric car. That's what you're really buying. And the charge point is initially an afterthought. So the charging point, it's got to be really simple, but it's also got to be super duper reliable. And if it doesn't work, you can't get to work. Having started out in my grandpa's old pig shed, building the first EO charging stations, we're now three and a half years in. We not only have the physical charging points, but we also have our own software platform, back office and apps and things for EV drivers. Uh, we've now sold over 5,000 stations. We're present in 25 countries. The UK accounts for about 50% of our business. And in the UK, we're working with some pretty nice brands, people like Uber and Addison Lee and EDF Energy and DHL, to name a few. So yeah, it's 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 going pretty well. Commercial fleet space is our core uh, focus, and it's where we've been most successful. A good place to be. So where do you start when you think I'm going to start a, a, a charging company? 
do you start with a sketch pad and you do it or do you start looking for designers to actually the, the look of the thing and then engineers how do, how do you start because it's, it seems yeah. like such a, a a big thing to take on if you don't break it down into little chunks do you know what I mean I mean I was always the thickest bloke in the class at school um, so combine that with being young and naive uh, the task didn't seem to be that complicated it's turned out to be quite complicated and difficult, but uh, at, the, at the start, it, it wasn't. It was pretty exciting. Um, the design for the first EO charger was actually, you know that really sexy yeah. mouse that you use with your Mac? I'd got a photo of that, and I turned it upright, and I put a socket on the front for EV drivers, a Type 2 socket. I put a, a socket on the front. I put the two letters EO, and I put this, um, we designed this Thunderbolt uh, a lightning bolt um, logo and I took this image into a uh, a local plastics moulding shop called Haverhill Mould and Tool uh, with some rum old boys in Suffolk and I said can you make me that they said yep no problem and we spent hours just playing on their CAD programs and tweaking it and printing off bits of blue um, foam and taking sandpaper and, and chiseling it down and after some time you know we, we ended up getting to, to where we are now so that that was the start that was the physical design part uh which you know I, I had a bit of experience doing in terms of the electronics and things you know that that was purely not me we'd had some good intel from uh other people that we'd worked with in the past and really the the, the remit was you know i said this is what i wanted to do again being more of a, a consumer than a, a designer um, and, and actually we then worked with designers to, to build a product to, to do what uh, we wanted it to do. So I take no credit for the intelligence that's gone into uh, making this thing really clever. You kind of came into it at a really interesting time where a lot of those really early mistakes had been made, lots of early learning done, but still a lot more to learn, mm -hmm. particularly with Tesla leading the way, but also a... a, a an Internet of Things y, connected homey kind of world that two or three years ago was just starting, people are starting to understand, oh, actually, okay, mm. so this is this is gonna this is gonna work. So it, do you feel like it was a good time for you to kind of come into that EV community? i it was I think actually the timing was was almost perfect. We came in it as a as a second generation business. So we'd you know we'd seen uh, the mistakes made by the the first movers, learned a lot about, you know, as I said earlier, what not to do. Uh, but more importantly, what what to do? The product took twelve months to to build, and I think we probably got in there and we started. You know, I've loaded up my car and with some charging points and, and started going around the UK trying to sell them to installers and things. But the timing for doing that selling part was absolutely spot on. It feels like if we'd been maybe six, eight months later, there there, there suddenly felt like an influx of of competitors, not only stem up in the UK. But also the the main European players come to the UK and enter our market. I actually feel lucky that we we got in when we did. I wouldn't have wanted to be much later, but you know, still, of course, it's in reality what five percent roughly of new car sales are electric. So we've still got ninety five percent to go. So it's it's early days, and and although we feel you know blessed to to get in it when we did, it would have been fine getting in a bit later. Okay, so we go from that first product that you've made, had prototyped. Mm. 12 months later, you've made them, and then the, 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 the even harder job of getting people to part with their cash to buy one of your products. So that's on the market uh, to, to, at that point. That's on the market, mm. and you're selling those. Yeah. But obviously, as an entrepreneur and as a founder, your brain, you've always got, firstly, four brains working at once. You know, what's happening today, but what's happening in five years? And so had you already been thinking about, all right, what's next, and then what's next, and then what's next? So how quickly did you move on to some more products and, mm. and the next stage? Well, I think the reality is we, we went to market with a fairly broad remit in terms of you know, who we were targeting. We, we set out to sell to homes, workplaces and destinations. There are three sectors or seg market segments that are quite different. Having launched the product into the market and you, know, you think uh, one car kind of sales tactic will work and then it doesn't work, you have to be fairly nimble. We've, of course, I was always thinking about where I wanted to go and... and you know, EO's greater ambition is, is, and EO stands for Electricity Online, our ambition is to be an energy company. And that's where we, get, we want to get to. But to get there, 
and especially as we were privately funded by my my dad, who's our now MD, as I said, you know, we had to focus on making money on day one uh, and, and along the way. So the first year really was just gritting our teeth and trying to sell as many products as possible. We've been through a, a number of different strategies uh, and there were times where it felt like each month we, we changed the plan. But, you know, I think that's probably classic of every single startup. We've managed to find a really good gap uh, in this commercial fleet sector and, you know, listing some of the, the companies I, I mentioned at the beginning. You know, those companies are, they're, they're global businesses, all of whom have significant numbers of vehicles and we're working with them right at the start of their EV transition, which for me is really exciting. And I guess in terms of strategy, we were very much led by our customers. Being, again, a small team and not me personally being a technical person, you, you tend to listen or try to listen to uh, the, the market's demand. And, and uh, in that sense, you know, we were listening to our, our fleet customers and the product has developed most significantly, significantly for that market segment. Having said that, our biggest selling product is the EO Mini, which we sell uh, lots of to homeowners. And, and you know what? And it looks great, and it's nice, and it just—it's not too imposing. It's a—it's you know, it's like this is the size that it needs to be to put everything inside. So why make something really big for your wall at home? Do you know what I mean? Like it's just, just the perfect size. Annoyingly, it was my dad's idea. <laughs> um, I love it. <laughs> so annoying. Uh, <laughs> but he, because he, you know, of course, he, he was uh, an EV skeptic, like most people. And having been involved early on in starting this business, uh, of course, he, he's, he slowly but surely got sold on, on the fact that EV is actually quite fun to drive. Yeah. So he ended up buying uh, an EV and it came to the point at which we were looking to install a charging point. Actually, he posed the question, why the F do you want to shove a big old box on the side of this lovely house yeah. and so we sat with the engineers and said you must you know it's just a plug it must it, there must be a way to make it smaller um I, I i don't want it to be imposing at all i want it preferably to be uh hidden um like a normal plug socket and so led by john jardine you know we came up with the Yemeni. <laughs> It's, it's very cool and uh, it makes you wonder why didn't someone do that before like all great ideas sure. why didn't someone do that before um, yeah, look, I saw the news today yeah. that D DHL are opening their first electric only distribution centre mm. so the only vehicles turning up to that and it's a yes. small test bed but you think oh blimey that's DHL starting now yes like and like and there's a few DHL vehicles to go mm. electric so are you finding those partners to work with that haven't yet got those relationships then um yeah, I think, you know, it would be silly to try and... Well, actually, I, I say silly. When, when, when I first started selling uh, the EO products, uh, you know, clearly I went to go and talk to the car companies because that's the obvious thing to do. And they basically closed the door on my face and said, look, we've got existing relationships with X, Y, and Z and they're three-year contracts and, you know, you, you guys are just new and you're coming out based out of pig shed. And that's a bit, you know, you've had, you've had bad experiences with everyone else and your customers are complaining and... Um, you know, whatever else, and it, we don't care. Yeah. And actually, the reality is, unfortunately, most of the car companies, they're, they're getting increasingly better by the month, but certainly at the time, they were struggling very much at dealership level to sell EVs effectively. They probably didn't want to sell EVs. So those doors were closed pretty early on, and so I actually read this book. Um, there's a chap called Sam Walton who set up Walmart, and uh, I won't bore you with the story because it's boring, but... He, uh, when he set up Walmart, there was a number of other uh, companies that established themselves to do serious discounting on products. And whilst they would go and look at all the big cities and, and try and put stores in that, the most busy street corners, he'd go off and find little small towns and, and go off and, and be the only company operating in that location. And so we took a bit of a leaf out of his book and, and rather than try and push water uphill by offering just a better service and a better product, actually, let's go and look elsewhere where no one else is looking. And so we decided to, to actually go international pretty early on. Uh, and that's why we're in, surprisingly, to most is 25 countries on the basis that I worked for a company that was that made charging points and was here first and had the contracts with the car companies and the energy companies and the supermarkets. So I knew what to do. I knew what service you had to provide and how you had to deliver that. And whilst we couldn't get that in the UK, those contracts... 
perhaps if we look to somewhere like Australia, which might be three or four years behind, or Thailand, which is five or six years behind, and we gave them a second generation product with the right equipment, whether it be presentations or, or systems and processes to go and secure those uh, those deals, then you know, assuming we pick the right partner and train them up correctly, uh, we're pretty confident they could go and uh, deliver for us. They have. So we've got car company deals outside of the UK through our distribution partners, but not here in the UK yet. Okay, let's talk about, let's go back to the products a little bit, because what is uh, really interesting is how everything's going to fit together in uh, in the energy future. So we haven't got any PV on our roof, but mm. again, having just moved, it's a long-term home for us. It's We live in the south of England, so solar makes quite a lot of sense. Storage makes a bit of sense, but there's a bit of capital expenditure there, which mm. maybe we're not quite ready for having just bought a house. And then with an, being an EV owner, how that all fits together, because... Having a, a relatively high tech car is one thing. Yeah. Surely that all needs to be joined up. And you you have some a connected product yeah. that in the future I would like to look down at my phone and know is my car charging? How much energy is going yeah. from my roof either to the grid or to the car? I'm sure those products are kind of out there at the moment, but you are you you're working into that space as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, from a as you said, it's smart technology standpoint. Our core focus up until this point has very much been at the depot, at the workplace for commercial fleets. Um, we're now bringing that technology into the home uh, and are looking to launch our, uh, it's called the EO Mini Pro, and that will be a smart version of the EO Mini. So internet connected, come with a nice app. Uh, it will link in with your solar panels and you can monitor energy usage remotely. You can um, choose to send your solar energy into your car. Um, and we've actually, uh, alongside that, launched a partnership, we're about to launch a partnership with a British manufacturer of battery storage. So we've been trialling uh, an EO charger plus uh, their battery for about eight months now. Um, and the proposition very much is EV charger plus battery for people with solar. You know, EO's vision from, from the outset was you know, electricity online, but within that to combine renewable generation, so solar PV, with battery storage, uh, with a smart grid, behind it all and then of course the the ev part um so bit by bit we're, we're kind of piecing that together the eo part the electricity online part is of course you know we want to be able to give the consumer the ability to control their energy better and essentially save themselves some money and the fact it's green is is awesome because in, in reality evs only stack if the energy going into them are are green there's a few things happening you know the final point that you mentioned was Clearly, there's a, there's a capital investment um, into putting things like battery storage units into your house. So there's some interesting models around fun, financing uh, the batteries um, and you know, the commercials are looking like they'll stack on purely the basis that when you combine it with solar and this massive energy requirement that is your car, there's a, a financial model um, that works for us as, as an investor. Yeah, um, we, yeah, because you know, in terms of our home, I don't know whether we're particularly frugal with our energy usage, but we'll get through because we have uh, smart meters, obviously, at home. So we get like three to four kilowatt hours a day. It's just the two of us, no yep. kids. Actually, that's not a lot. And, uh, you know, mm. um, uh, our American listeners to the podcast that have got some HVAC systems and stuff that are getting through fifteen, and they've got some air con, and they live in hot markets, and they're getting through fifteen or twenty kilowatt hours a day. That's, I mean, that's a different. But then again, they might be in hot mm. markets where solar, like you know, Nevada is is particularly good. But actually, it's a temperate climate where we live. Very little energy usage. Maybe like a four or five kilowatt hour battery is kind of all we need. Like yes. I know I look at the yeah, Tesla yeah. power wall and going like, oh, I'd love all the storage. But mm. actually, like most people in certainly here in the UK don't need a yes. lot of home storage. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the product that we're working with is it's a four point eight kilowatt uh, battery storage pack, um, which, as you said, is enough for most homes. The fact it's smaller means it's, it's cheaper. Um, so from a, a you know, funding standpoint, it, it works. Um, so it, it's an exciting time, and I think the uh, you know, the final part on that is I don't think most people are engaged in their energy bill until they buy an electric car. And I certainly know. I, I live in a flat in London, and uh, British Gas send a nice bill through my door every month. But then you pay it. Unfortunately, I live in a flat, and uh, I, I don't have an EV in town. Yeah. Um, so, you know, until you have that EV and, and suddenly your your bill potentially doubles... I don't think you as a consumer are really, really engaged. So um, I think with this uh, 
driving EVs in terms of volume, I think we'll see an increase in in deployment of storage as well, uh, which links, as I said earlier, uh, the whole piece of the the puzzle together. Okay, so general kind of general questions about where the the market is at the moment. Um, oil companies yep. keep buying energy companies. Do you think there's they they see an end, or are they just hedging their bets? Because uh, uh, you know, a hundred and was it one hundred and thirty million? Uh, BP Charge Master, um, which is probably you know a rounding error on their budget sheet when you look at their budgets of of, of billions. Are they serious about it? Do you think, or are they are they? Uh, where do you see that going? Yeah, I, I think they are. Uh, I think like any global corporate, it's pretty difficult to move at pace. So this market is so dynamic; every single day it changes. For a big company to implement uh, new strategies on a daily or weekly or, or, or monthly basis. It's really challenging for them to make those acquisitions. I think is is really positive. It's good in the sense that um, it it means to the normal consumer that this thing's at, is actually happening. It's good for us because it gives us um, makes us quite interesting to potential investors or, or whoever else. It's also good for us, I think, because there is a fear from a startup like us that you know, if you are acquired an oil company, they might kill your creativity. Um, and the fact that some of our com- competition have been bought by oil companies, I think, is is good for us. Uh, independence is, is key. The last man standing will win. So you live in London, you live in a flat, you live in town. Um, yeah. How are we going to solve this problem of all the people that live in apartments when everyone drives an electric car? How? Uh, uh, this isn't. I know this isn't a question you need to know the answer to, but in terms of your mm. gazing into a crystal ball, how do we solve that? On street parking? Charges at petrol stations? I, destination I, charges when you go do your shopping? I think it's a mix of everything. I mean, the the... You know, the future vision, of course, is that cars will be autonomous. And actually the fact that there's a problem with implementing or deploying uh, charging points on the street at this moment in time, is, is it will be a historic issue. You'll be able to use land that's easily accessible with uh, decent power supplies. Um, of course, we've got to get from today to that point. But in the interim, I think it's, it's a, a general mix of solutions. So... You know, of course, rapid charging points. Um, I think rapid charging points in hubs, uh, like the forecourt model, is actually something that is is really solid. Um, on street charging, okay, but fairly messy and expensive. I generally think there's not one one answer. Where most people are, isn't it? They're just like, you know what? Let's try everything yeah. and see see what see what sticks. I think that's I think that's the only thing to do. Uh, I think not doing anything is is. A massive negative. Everyone will complain about that. You know, that people will see like the ubertristy stuff that's in in lamp posts and go, "Oh, well, you know, it's wrong for this, this, this." Mm. But if you, if you think you can do better, go and do something. Don't exactly. complain about it. You know, go and make yeah. something and create something. Um, okay, uh, so investments. We read that in the in the news recently. So your press release come out. So investment yeah. into EO, which was a, a big moment for you. It was a big moment. I think June the eighth, uh, we got our our money. So big moment. Paid my dad back and. Um, you know, I feel uh, obviously much much better about it. I think this, as I, as we've said countless times in this in this interview, you know, the market's moving at such a pace uh, to try and grow organically would be very challenging. Um, to stay meaningful, you know, you have to secure some pretty uh, serious contracts in the next uh, you know few months or, or 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 years. And in order to do that, you know, of course, you've got to have really good tech you've got to have a really solid foundation to your business um so it was the right time for us to to take on some investment scale up the team um because i think you know uh, there's going to be an onslaught in in requirement whether that's in the uk or across the world and um, we need to be ready for that say three to five years time yeah. where do you think where could things be because no one of course no one knows definitively but yeah, where, EO it, well, let's start with EO. eo where so first of all eo where could it be I want to be with this business for as long as possible. Um, I want to build a billion dollar company. I want to be in as many countries around the world as possible. Uh, I want to be the the go to name for home and, and and fleet charging. We we've got a long way to go, um, but we're not in a rush. So we'll take our time and we'll get there. Uh, I'm confident in that. And as for the kind of the market, you've mentioned autonomy already. Yeah. Is that is that is that a serious thing that we? It, it seems to be these companies like like Uber yeah. are about to well the news today even this week's news is that they're thinking of spinning off their self driving yeah. 
division for uh, to make it more agile and to bring in new yep. investment. And everyone's got their own piece of of uh, well, any, their own, own ideas on it, autonomy. They even say that the Model Three is built for you know it's got however many cameras in it, and that uh, it can do it, it will be used for autonomous fleets in the future. Mm. Is is that a serious thing we should think about? Do you think? Hundred percent. There's no doubt in my mind that autonomous vehicles are, are going to happen. And yeah, it's my belief certainly that wireless charging is going to be a really important part to that. There's a lot of doubters in, in wireless charging, but I think the three to five year time frame is, is when you'll start to see it become, or at least start to become mainstream. And autonomous vehicles will, will follow as, as a mainstay, certainly for things like taxi fleets and cities toward the back end of five, six, seven years. That's my opinion. Um, you know, the other cool stuff that will happen, I think, is you know, you're seeing this emergence between the vehicle OEMs and the energy companies. You know, there's lots of interesting business models uh, being debated, being tested, being uh, you know, deployed, looking at things like vehicle to grid and how that can not only uh, benefit the grid, but also create some interesting commercial models around ownership of vehicles. Amazing. Well, look, thank you so much for your time on the, on the podcast today. If people want to listening now, not just in the UK, but around the world, as you say, you're an international business. Mm. How do they find out more about EO Charging? Go to www.eocharging.com. Email us, uh, hello at eocharging.com. I'm on, you can't have my mobile, but <laughs> <laughs> on Twitter it's at cjardine. <laughs> And uh, sign up to the newsletter. Sign up to the newsletter. Miles will be very happy. <laughs> Miles is his uh, marketing supremo. He'll be delighted we got that in. Absolutely. So. Miles thank, is the man. Thank you so much for coming in. Cheers. Thanks. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly did. Fascinating to get Charlie on the show. And I'd love to stay in touch with EO Charging as well. I have a feeling they are going places. Thank you very much for listening today. The news returns tomorrow. Your comments return tomorrow. Your question of the week's uh, week, questions of the week, I think, uh, get answered on Sundays. We set a new question as well. And we always read out your answers on a Sunday. That'll be tomorrow's podcast. A reminder for Patreon supporters. You've got your bonus episode to look forward to this weekend as well. Uh, that'll be on Patreon as always for the $10. And above, supporters, uh, with the extra news, we do a deep dive into the news for Patreon uh, supporters. But if you support us online, thank you very much to 107 people that do. Hello to Phil. Phil Roberts from Electric Future. Been swapping emails with him. We're going to get him on the podcast soon because he's talking of heavy thinkers. Uh, he's a real deep thinker of solar and storage. We were chatting about that on email this week. I'll, um, I'll, we're going to get Phil on the podcast as soon as we can and, uh, and let you know what he's up to. Hello to Cesar Trujillo and David Allen, OEM Audio of New Zealand and evpower.co.nz and Sasha Pallenberg. Uh, Sasha is a partner of the show, although all those four are partners of the show. And I'm enormously grateful. Thank you so much for your support to help make this program. Hello to our executive producers, as always, Ashley Hill, Arid Gear Skalsveen, Biard Fuchstack, Brian Weatherall, Chris Benson, Chris Hopkins, Darren Bird, David Partington, David Prescott, Damian Davis, Jack Oakley, John Bailey, John H. Mayer III, John Timmis, Kevin Mayerson, Louis Hopkin, Luke Cully, Marcel Lohman, Marcel Ward, Marcel Martin Croft, sorry Martin, Martin Croft, Matthew Ellis, Matthew Gruby, Nice to get your email recently, Matthew. Uh, Neil E. Roberts, Paul Stevenson, Paul Seeger Smith, Philippe Calvay, Rene Schneider, Rod James, Scott Callahan, and our friends at the Limousine Line in Sydney. Thank you to all of our executive producers. You're doing a fine, sterling job. Thank you for bringing this podcast to thousands of people around the world. There are 277 previous episodes of the show to listen to online. Bunch of interviews, bunch of news as well. Uh, from all the usual places you get podcasts. We're on YouTube, and I put the audio on Patreon. And if you could take two minutes to leave a little review, or like a rating or review on your particular podcast, platform that would mean so much to me thank you very much we are on patreon.com slash ev news daily and we'll be back tomorrow for sunday's show with all of your questions of the week answered and a brand new question in the meantime have a wonderful day i'll catch you tomorrow